Thank you for joining today's webinar, Emotionally Intelligent Leadership. We are very excited to offer that to you today. My name is Michelle Mickelson. I'm a career and professional development program coordinator here at the U of R, and I will moderate today's session. First, I would like to recognize and acknowledge that the beautiful and historical U of R College Avenue campus is on Treaty 4 territory, the traditional territories of the Nihiawak, Cree, Anishinaabek, Soto, Dakota, Lakota, Nakota, and the homeland of the Métis Mischief Nation. It humbles me to learn about the past while working on my own truth and reconciliation journey along with you all. We are so glad you joined us today because we have a phenomenal webinar presented by our very exceptional expert, Christine Saxon. She has over 25 years of experience as an advisor, consultant, coach across multiple industries. She is certified in several assessments, including EQI 2.0 and Myers-Briggs. Um, she delivers her programs across three countries, including for our professional leadership certificate, advanced leadership certificate, and our customized programs. Um, one of her programs takes her to Germany that she works on really hard is her leadership program for German female academics and power. So any questions you have about emotional intelligence, which as we hear more and more, is the key to becoming what is really a true leader. So with that, I will hand it over to Christine so she can get started and tell us a little bit more about that so we can start on that journey ourselves. Welcome. Michelle, thank you so much and welcome everyone. Wonderful to be here with you. Um, we're gonna spend 45 minutes of me sharing some some stories, some examples, some theory, and then please don't hold back the questions. And like Michelle says, um, you can you can start your journey or continue your journey. Um, I am a like like Michelle talked about. I'm a professional certified coach. So when I do webinars and classes, really what my goal is is that each of you, as an individual, will walk away with at least one thing in your pocket, something new that you can start today. As you can see from the slide that's up here right now, you know, we talk about emotional intelligence a lot, and it is a counterbalance to thinking, right? Feeling and thinking, emotion and logic. And so this is about finding that balance for yourself and really, really pulling from your own strengths. You don't have to become someone new to become more emotionally intelligent. This is about being more yourself. Okay, can you see my turtles on there now, Michelle? Okay, perfect. Just make sure the slides are working. So may, maybe I was just thinking this, maybe the, the um, thinking behind these, these turtles, these are baby turtles, by the way, on, on a parent's shell. Maybe my thinking um, inadvertently was you can go slow with emotional intelligence. It's a, it's a, it's a me game and it's a long game. So let, let's talk a little bit about it. We're going to look at what's the difference between EI and EQ because we kind of use them interchangeably. We'll talk really also and, and explore what's the link with leadership? Like why, why did this all start with CEOs, for example? Coaches like myself came in, first of all, to organizations and helped the C-suite folks. Now, happily, a lot of organizations have it embedded throughout. And then I can't, I won't leave you without strategies. So I'm going to give you some strategies you can start to use literally today. And like I said, my goal is that each of you will walk away with one. So grab your pen and paper. There's going to be lots of stuff worth stealing, adding to your toolkit. And uh, I challenge you to find something that you go that, right? That one, that's for me. All right. So here's what we're going to do. In this 45-minute webinar, you're going to um, get to have a glimpse into the assessment that we use. I use this assessment in my coaching a lot with the U of R in our, in particular in our advanced leadership certificate, which is a specialized small cohort based, um, really cool deep dive certificate uh, that's advanced. And what one of the ways that it's as advanced is participants take the EQI 2.0 assessment and really dig deep into understanding where they are today and where they wanna get to with their emotional intelligence. So we're gonna have a glimpse at it and use it as a way to, to expand your awareness of what emotional intelligence is and what EQ is. Then you're going to meet three leaders. So I have kind of avatar or scenarios that honestly are, are a compilation of some of my clients. Um, I've taken kind of three or four people and went, hmm, you know what? These are some of the things that come up that are trends for them. These are some of the strategies that help them. 
And as adults, we like this stuff, right? We like looking at examples. We like hearing about others. So hopefully this will help embed some of this for you and help you figure out what, what you want, what you want and what you need. So hello, my name is Christine. I'm like Michelle said, I'm a certified leadership coach. I'm, I'm internationally certified. I have my own executive coaching and leadership business. I've been, I've been focused on emotional intelligence for probably 20 years. I also worked in HR previously at, at Farm Credit Canada. I'm known for my emotional intelligence as a human and my ability to help people understand and improve their emotional intelligence. So full disclosure, I'm sure not perfect at it. Being a leadership coach or an EI consultant or something like that doesn't necessarily equate to being really emotional intelligent or to have been, been born emotionally intelligent. Michelle mentioned that one of the other assessments I, I administer is the Myers-Briggs assessment, which comes from personality theory. And of course, personality theory, theory tells us we were born that way, right? More of an extrovert, more of an introvert, more of a thinker, more of a feeler. And we can flex. Emotional intelligence and EQ is unique in that you start growing it when you're born and you can keep going. That's one of the reasons it gets me so excited is because we all can keep, this can become a daily practice of becoming more emotionally aware, um, improving our emotional regulation. There's so much, as you'll see when you see the model, the EQI model, there's a lot going on with emotional intelligence. So when I first got certified, for the EQI 2.0, so I can administer it to people. I took an assessment with, with a coach and went, oh, let's look at my scores and went, oh, expletive. <laughs> I am not right down the middle. I'm not super high. My scores were all over the place because that's what it's like. There's not one way to be. And I personally scored really, really high on empathy and quite low on emotional independence. So I'm gonna be honest and tell you my first reaction. Well, this is stupid. I flew to Toronto to get, you know, certified in this. What a what a what a ridiculous assessment. I'm so independent. And then I dug into it and went, oh, it's emotionally independent. So someone with such high empathy gets in other people's business, for example. Both of these were getting in my way. And good news, I've improved on them. That's what's wonderful about emotional intelligence. It's not, oh, you're stuck like this, or this is your default, or this is the box you fit in. You just can keep working and working on it, as I do. And I hope that you are encouraged to, and you, lots of you probably are already. So really what I'm saying and sharing my own experience is welcome to being human. Um, so here, th thanks to my daughter several years ago when I was working on some slides, she is one of those people who loves watching the cat videos and she's real sensitive and, and loves humor. So she sent me some slides and uh, here's what I'm using them to represent. Typical ways we respond when things get tough, when it's stressful, when, when, you know, when a global pandemic hits, when we're in a conflict with someone. So as you look at these, I wonder which resonate for you and which you've experienced lately. First one, avoiding, really common. Okay, so avoiding, sticking our head in the stand, jump, you know, climbing down a hole. Next one, and just look at these for yourself, biting back, right? Having a reaction because something someone said has triggered you or hurt you, and then not just sitting with it, but biting back. Very human. It's our amygdala in our brain trying to protect us that creates some of these reactions. Name calling. And think about this, maybe not out loud, but if you're like me, in my head, yeah, sometimes. Flipping the bird. When I teach in Germany, I had to tell them what this meant. I had to show them. It's like, we have this finger, and if we put other, like, oh, that, okay. So driving, someone cuts you off in traffic. The same person you might walk by in a park and say hello pleasantly. But there's something that happens when we get behind a wheel sometime, that defensiveness, and we might even react by giving someone the finger or raising our fist at them. Oops. Deflecting with humor. This is so common. If I was able to see you all and said, raise your hand right now, my experience when I teach on this topic is at least 50% of the people go, yeah, I deflect with humor. And it's a way not to sit with the emotion necessarily in the room or to bring down the, the temperature in the room. These are all normal human behaviors. Rescuing, right? This big fuzzy dog probably could have gone down the stairs by itself. How many big fuzzy dogs in your life, metaphorically, have you jumped in and rescued when really they might have been capable? 
this one, this is a hard one. And we sometimes do it consciously or not is undermining others. It can come from a really protective stance when we might feel injured or threatened. These are all normal things for us to do. And then how about being overly protective? Kind of like rescuing, but even more, wrapping your arms around someone and getting in their business. So welcome to being human. Being in conflict or uncertainty truly brings out the animal in us. And it's that amygdala in our brain that creates the reactions and the reactivity, fight, flight, freeze, or fawn. Very normal. And 85 to 90% of our daily stuff that we do, making sense of things, reacting, all of that is fully automated by our brain. We really only have 10 to 15% where we've got the wheel, where we've got the paddle and we can, and we can paddle. So because of that, thank goodness for emotional intelligence and the theory and what we've learned. Because as I mentioned, you can just keep on going and growing. So I heard about a woman who bought a new dress and went to a wedding. Okay, and I heard this story and, and then saw, saw a picture about it. If you're thinking right now, you might be thinking, oh, I'll bet she had, you know, she wore a white dress or she wore the same dress as the bridesmaids or whatever you might be thinking, right? We often go, oh, did you hear the story about? In this case, this woman chose how she wanted to react. She met the carpet in the, in the hotel that the wedding was in. And she's my hero. Her emotional regulation, her sense of self, whatever it is about her, made instead of going, give me your jacket, I got to put this on, or I got to run away and go home and change, or I can put it on inside out or whatever. She went, take a picture. This thing's going social. So emotional intelligence is so valuable to us in our day-to-day, -day, in our work, in our relationships, and really in our sense of self. Emotional intelligence rocks. Here are some emotional intelligence rocks. When you just look at those and look at the, the colors, the images, the words, there's so much variability in emotional intelligence. So thank you, overused meme baby. Yeah, I'll slow down. Let's start now with what is emotional intelligence? So there's two things I mentioned, right? EI and EQ. And as I said that earlier, you might be going, yeah, I do kind of just use them interchangeably. Or you now, when, if you already know the distinction, um, or once you hear what it is, you may now go, oh, they're calling that the wrong thing. Because um, emotional intelligence and EQ are different. Emotional intelligence is what we each have, like cognitive intelligence or social, right? This intelligence around emotions. EQ is the measure of it. So we have emotional intelligence, intelligence, we grow our emotional intelligence, and what helps us are these markers, is seeing where you are today and whether you want to, I talk about a volume button a lot, turn up the volume or turn down the volume on where your, your ranking is, if it's serving you or not serving you, if you want to grow it more or turn it down if it's getting in your way, or tailor it to the situation. This is what emotional intelligence can help you do, is really become flexible and self-aware and, and adapt. So I mentioned a pen and paper. I invite you right now. I'm going to go through some slides and just paint a bit of a picture of what emotional intelligence is and take notes for yourself about, hmm, I, I think I'm strong in that one, not so strong on this one, or maybe haven't tried one. So think about which ones resonate for you. So basically, emotional intelligence is a set of emotional and social skills that we then manifest and act out of. So with these skills, it impacts how we show up and it establishes how well we perceive ourselves and express ourselves. Huge impact on social relationships with other people, positive, negative, and neutral. It helps us with resilience, with coaching, with coping with challenges or not coping with challenges. And here's an interesting one. It, it, using emotional data. So I work with a lot of uh, people in agriculture and banking uh, lots of finance people, lots of university people at universities who are who are academic, and this one helps them to go. Oh, it's emotional data, not oh no, I'm overwhelmed, I'm flooded, I got the feels. But what emotional data am I identifying? And that brings it down and kind of simplifies it. And you can use that data in a more meaningful way, rather than feeling like you're no, you know, you're being led around by the nose by a red hot emotion. And then ultimately, emotional intelligence help helps us notice and then manage our reactions and make decisions that are more appropriate for us, that are more sound. 
So back in back in the late eighties and nineties, when it was when it was um, really became more mainstream. Here's one of the definitions: it's the ability to monitor your own emotions and other people's emotions, discriminate amongst them, and identify which is which, and then use that data to guide your thinking and your actions. It's doing something really concrete with that emotional data that you notice. Daniel Goleman is a bit of a guru in it, not in that he created emotional intelligence theory and developed it, but he really did sense making with it. So I'll just do a, a brief, and he's still, Daniel Goleman's been around, he's ageless, it seems. He's been around for a long time, and he's still doing podcasts and webinars, and you can check him out if you're interested. He also does change management stuff, and it's good stuff. I'm getting all technical on you. Uh, so Daniel Goleman says there are four things, four domains of emotional intelligence. First is knowing your emotions and then managing them, right? So the me part of knowing and managing, then recognizing and discriminating amongst and, and being able to notice signs of what other people's emotions might be and using that data to manage relationships more effectively. So quite technical and logical, really, when you see it, when you see it this way. And he's charted it out. So, right, it's about awareness and management of self and others. So I invite you to think about which of those would you want to start with and develop further for yourself? You might have been, you know, reading self-awareness books and doing assessments for years and feel like your self-awareness is quite high and maybe you want to improve your social awareness and ability to have empathy and name other people's, for example. So this is very individual. When I coach leaders, regardless of where they are with their self-awareness, we might just spend a week on self-awareness or we might spend a year or whatever that looks like because I meet people where they are and we always start with self-awareness. It might even just be people sending me their, what they know about themselves, their assessment results, things like that. We always start with self-awareness because EI starts with self and then you can go to self-management, to social awareness, to relationship management, which is why um developing your own is so key that's what this webinar is about is how can you start with yourself as a leader and and become more of the leader you want to be or more comfortable in yourself whatever that goal is for you so here's a tip for you if you want to ramp up your own development is well rather than reading everything and going i need to change that i need to change that i need to change that i need to grow that there's a difference between strengths weaknesses and what i call gaps and I've actually added to this and now I have an A in there and I call it swag, strengths, weaknesses, attributes and gaps. And I have people chart this out. Once you identify what your strengths are, yeah, maximize them, right? That's the positive part, you're already good at that. Your weaknesses, improve them. Your attributes, find a fit for them. Like I have a voice that projects well, so it's a fit for me being an instructor. And I've been told that, I've, I've been told with, from people with hearing impairment, that my, my tone and the depth of my voice and the pace that I speak is helpful. Great. It's not a strength or a weakness. It's an attribute. And then gaps isn't something we talk about very often. Fill them. Gaps are things you haven't tried before. So watch as we go forward for aspects of emotional intelligence that you don't know if it's a strength or a weakness because you haven't tried it. So remember I mentioned this, right? I was overly high on empathy and quite low on, low on emotional intelligence. I'm going to, and both were getting in my way. So I'm going to share with you a strategy that I used around that. If you think of empathy, I'm calling this empathy in the volume button. So think for yourself right now where you would be on this spectrum when it comes to just the natural empathy of, you know, being able to put yourself in other people's shoes to understand how they might be feeling or reacting. Is yours super high, almost non-existent, in the middle, just think about where it is for yourself and maybe maybe write a word to yourself describing where that is. Mine was so super high that years ago when I was an academic advisor on university campuses and in lots of one-on-one -on -one advising roles, if a student or someone came to me and was like, oh, it's the middle of the semester and I'm having a crisis and my, you know, my mother's very sick and I might cry before that student cried because I am a permeable, highly sensitive sponge to other people's emotions. And it was getting in my way, right? That wasn't good. But sometimes they'd go, are you okay? And I'd go, shoot, yeah, I'm fine. Hold on a minute. How are you? Because I naturally feel everything in the room. 
Whereas for some people, they say, really, I wouldn't even notice and wouldn't know. And there isn't, folks, there isn't a right way to be. It's a spectrum. Figuring out where you are and what you want to do about it is what's important. So mine was so high that I was like sitting on the elephant's back. I knew the elephant was there. I named the elephant. I made stories up about it because I would say, that person just rolled their eyes. That person went like this. I'll bet they're thinking such and such, right? And it would just make up stories. And this likely is resonating for some of you. Whereas others are going, what is she even talking about? We're all differently empathetic. So are you someone who notices the elephant in the room? The volume button concept is helpful sometimes. I learn to adjust my volume and I have strategies and they're, they're a little wonky. So I'm gonna share them with you because they're kind of fun. If you're one of these super sensitive people that notices a lot, Let's say I was sitting across from Michelle and she was telling me about something that was maybe triggering an emotion for me or I just felt myself taking it on too much. Let me think. I would picture Michelle with one side of her hair shaved and one green eyebrow. Can't be too much that you laugh, but it refocuses my brain from this emotional reaction to go, interesting, Michelle would look different like that. And it goes, and the emotion dissipates. The other one is picturing yourself in a bubble going doink and I'm st I'd still be there with Michelle but I would have this protective bubble. I use this with my highly sensitive executive coaching clients and it's incredible how how differently and how much it helps people. So that's for some of the super high folks. If you are going that sounds really weird. I've never experienced any of that or I know someone like that or my spouse or family member is like that but I'm more on the other end of the spectrum. There's a fabulous resource that's been floating around for years. This was from 2017. I think this might be the original one, but if you do a Google, Google search for 31 empathetic statements for when you don't know what to say, it's brilliant. There's all these things you can say so you can have something in your pocket so that even if you're not feeling the empathy, but you go, aha, this is one of those times when there's feelings going on. You can say, that must be hard for you. I can imagine this would be frustrating. I'm here to listen. And these simple statements can help turn down your story of, I don't have any empathy to, I have some empathy strategies. So folks, these are examples just from that one of, of strategies for self-regulation. Self-regulation around emotions, right? Start with self so that you can broaden into the other three. Self-awareness plus self-management, two of those boxes, gets you more towards self-regulation. Not cramming your emotions in, inside or burst in the mode or feeling shame about them. Figuring out what to do with them. Skills can help you. So here's, here's some examples. I invite you to look at which of these might be helpful to put in your toolkit. So just some examples of self-regulation. First one, checking in with yourself. What do I feel right now? Next one, actual emotional regulation, watching the, like regulating and watching the ups and the downs, the highs and the lows. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk to you about family emotions soon about this. Checking your biases. Thanks, automatic brain and thinking and unconscious bias, but you're not serving me right now. Pausing, just taking a moment, letting it cool down. Using the word perspective more often for yourself, going, oh, this isn't necessarily the truth. I feel these emotions about it. This is my perspective. It's an interesting reframe for our brain. Mindfulness, right? There's so much about that. Just being mindful, intentional. Like I said, take a moment, slowing down. Reality testing. Is this real or is it the story that my brain is making up? Thanks, brain. That story is not serving me. Boundaries, so important to self-regulate. First of all, you need to know your boundaries so that you can then ask for them to be respected. And, and have less of, less of an emotional impact for a lot of people. Reflection. When was the last time you got off the hamster wheel to sit and go, how am I doing with my feelings lately? Or checked in with a trusted person or gone to see a therapist or, 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 and just reflected. Uh, questioning your automatic responses and going, wait, what's my intention? And then finding more of a match between your intention and the impact. And this wonderful one for perspective, is this mine? Is this my hill to die on? Because my unconscious brain is sure telling me that it is. So some playful and some really concrete examples there. Hopefully each of you were able to grab at least one from that list. Oh, and pacing. 
um, not being the, the hamster on the wheel, slowing down at times or going faster at times. Okay, so this actually is an Angora, a giant Angora rabbit that someone blow dried. <laughs> so this is fluffy. Emotional intelligence is not. And yet, right? We used to say, oh, rainbows and sunshine and kumbaya and holding hands and isn't this nice. Emotional intelligence isn't actually soft or fluffy. The theory, the, the classes you take, they're not just about positive or happy emotions. You think about what I've talked about so far. It's about all of the emotions. And from a perspective of leadership, it's about how to use this emotional data, get skills in place, so you can have better business results with other people. There's a very strong business case for developing emotional intelligence in leaders. If you just look up business case for emotional intelligence, there is so much now and it's proven. So there's just a few examples. And these would be, um, these would be probably outcomes for most of your, your strategic plans. So then let's shed a little bit of light on the link between leadership and emotional intelligence. Because there is there's such an important link and we, we're, we're just knowing it more and more. Um, in, in 1998, way back, Daniel Goleman said, and it's, it's just quoted all the time now, that EI contributes 80 to 90% of the competencies that distinguish those outstanding leaders who keep getting advanced, who keep you know, having success from what he called average leaders. So I'm gonna go through just briefly and quickly, Goldman's competency talks about, you take a look at which ones you want to write down and go, that one I'm really good at, right? Strength, that one, I'm not so good at, I might want to work on it, weakness. And that one, I don't know, I've not actually tried it because that might be a gap. So just pull out what works for you. So here are what some of the behaviors are of those outstanding leaders. First one, being able to recognize and understand your own mood, emotions, motivations, and how they impact other people. So you can go, hmm, I'm okay with that one. Or, oh yeah, right? That's a, that's a growth area for me, or I've never tried. Being able to control, reframe, or redirect when you have an impulse, a disruptive impulse, so not blurting, or a mood that makes you shut down, or whatever those things might, might be for you that show up as, um, as what Dr. Alice Boys, she writes books called um, The Healthy Mind Toolkit, The Anxiety Toolkit. She calls these things thinking errors, just the way that our brain thinks in a way that's an error. And it kind of lightens it because, yeah, blurting things out, you could feel shameful about, or you could go, oh, thanks, brain. That's an error I need to correct. That innate passion to work for, uh, for good, for benevolence, for productivity, for whatever it is, and reasons that go beyond money or status, and the, the natural energy and propensity to pursue goals, to persist, to, to get through the hard stuff. And then the ability to that, that other part, right? Self and other, to understand, to watch for, make sense of and understand other people's emotional makeup and then treat them according to their emotional reactions, not your reaction to it, to help manage relationships, build networks and just really build that common ground and rapport with people. Here's a few more. Here's how emotional intelligence intelligence looks when it's well developed and then we'll glance at what it looks like when it's undeveloped so you can see what you recognize in yourself or others. So I actually did a survey of people that I was working with and clients probably over 10 years ago and said you know those people with high EI who are leaders what is it about them and here's what I heard and these were the trends they have a presence how you get that I can't tell you right probably by developing emotional intelligence but you likely know what I mean some people just have that presence they're humble, they focus on others. Again, it's just the way they are. They have a presence. They acknowledge others. So they shine the light on others, not necessarily just themselves. They have that people prowess and finesse. They ask more questions than give answers. They're curious rather than telling. They're not afraid of criticism and feedback. They don't seek the light for themselves. Instead, they elevate others. And here's some more. Here's this, this is from some of the literature, how people, how leaders with high EI function then. They manage when, when there's organizational change or institutional initiatives coming, they manage the people impacts in a positive way. 
They have those important, courageous conversations, right? Good old elephant in the room. I don't call these difficult conversations. Why add that pressure to it? Why assume it's going to be difficult when you go in? So they have these important and, and courageous conversations. They just show up and they role model how to be without being perfect. They learn from their mistakes and restart as needed. They customize their approach to individuals and situations using emotional intelligence. They help others maintain dignity, right? When something hard happens, there isn't the shame, there isn't the blame. It's helping people rise to that higher level of responsibility, accountability. My main theme in my business is paddle your own boat. So when I read this, they also help people paddle their own boat with their own agency. And then finally, here are some examples of how EI looks when it's low or underdeveloped. And it's the opposite of some of those things we just looked at, not, not acknowledging others, or in some cases, taking credit for others. I learned this lesson myself when I had a director. I worked on uh, actually at the University of New Brunswick with all of the residents, student housing. And I did six months. I was hired to do a six month um, needs assessment of the whole community, see what we came up with and create a three-year plan. So I was so engaged with all the students and the student leaders and the faculty, and we had groups and just gathered all this information, created the report. Two levels above me, my senior director took it, took my name off it, and took it around as his own when he presented it. He got called out because many of the people he was presenting it to worked on the committees with me. So he didn't acknowledge, even if he had said, this is Christine Saxon's and mine, think of what that differ differing impact would have been. So he lost so much credibility by not taking credit. My skin in the game with this, I didn't speak up. I didn't speak up because I just went, whoa, what is he doing? And I was afraid to. Today, I recognize I could have said, hey, I think this might not serve you. What do you think about both of us having our names on it? I learned through that lesson myself too about my own accountability. Another way it shows up, and again, these are these are thinking errors. These, these are growth areas, and this might resonate for some of you, trying to be perfect. If I were to ask right now, hey, anyone here on the path to perfection? Yes, there's a lot of us because we're such high performers, and we've been given A's and B pluses, and we've been ranked and taught and socialized that perfection and 100% is what matters. So trying to be perfect or right rather than open and curious and growing. The third one, not taking accountability or responsibility for the impact of your behavior in others. What, you think I did that? I wouldn't do that, don't you know me? Totally invalidates the person instead of, I can see why you'd feel that way. What do we need to do now about it? And we feel embarrassed, we feel hurt, we feel defensive, that's that automatic brain. And the last one, Passive or aggressive behaviors, which often show up as shame, or they come from shame or blame, rather than assertive and clear and accountable. So we're talking ideal state. Please don't take those 37 or 42 things, whatever they are, and try to do them all. Anytime I do the EQI assessment with someone, we analyze the whole thing. It's a 37-page assessment. We analyze it. We look through it. They come up with an action plan, and I say, pick one place to start, and let's work on that for two or three weeks. Okay, so this is just a note again of what I've just been saying, just to watch for the areas that you want to focus on. So I'll give you a quick glimpse. I'm just looking at the time. I'll give you a quick glimpse at the assessment so you understand what it is. Then I'm going to show you a few. I might not do all three. I have three leaders. I might just pick one and show you um, so you can see some strategies. So the EQI, as I mentioned, is the assessment that we use in the Advanced Leadership Certificate, which is. Um, uh, we do a kickoff session. It's a small mod, a small module. I think usually maximum 10 or 12 people, but really nice, close cohort based five modules with different instructors. And then in between that, you work with a coach, you do the assessment, you get your results, you debrief, you have a couple sessions with us as coaches, and then come together and uh, share what your next steps are. Um, it's a wonderful deep dive for people who really want to look at the emotions, the emotional intelligence, self-awareness piece, and do some self, self-growth. So the EQI, <clears throat> you can look this up. I'm just going to show you a few of these because you can look it up in yourself. It's called the EQI 2.0. It helps you assess strengths. It's the kind of stuff I've been 
talking about. <clears throat> Assess today where you are, right? So you'll have your benchmark because once you work on some of them, turning them up or turning them down, <clears throat> excuse me, you might retake it and see how it's changed. It's a wonderful tool for benchmarking your progress. So if you look at the model here, the blue in the middle that says emotional intelligence has 15 words or, or um, what do we call them? E competencies around it. That's what you're measured on. So three self-perception perception competencies, the red one, self-regard, self-actualization, emotional self-awareness. So anyone that takes it, you get this list of your 15 competencies and where you rank. And then you can figure out what you want to focus on. So it does this using five different aspects. So those broader categories are self-perception, expressing your emotion, self-expression, then that interpersonal one, how you interact with others. And then really importantly, how do you make decisions and use your emotions to make those decisions? And then how does, how does all of this help you with stress management and coping with challenges? When you look this up, you can find this stuff on, on the internet just to get an understanding of what each of these categories are, what each of these mean. Oh, it's, a, it's a very robust and deep dive assessment. There's a list of all of them. And then you look at them and go, what am I already strong in? Which one do I want to grow on? And which would serve me today with where I am in my own development? <clears throat> so let's meet, yeah, I've got some time to do this. Let's meet a couple of our leaders then using what we talked about and you think about yourself as a leader. Watch for if any of this, if you recognize any of this in yourself or maybe people that you work with or who report to you or that you know. And there's some strategies that you can take away as well. So meet Mariah. I made the name up. This is a reflection of some of my clients. Um, Mariah is more of a thinker than a feeler. Generally doesn't share feelings at work and really says she suffers from the analysis by paralysis, overanalyzing stress and actually her brain doesn't shut, shut off and she has sleep issues. When Mariah did her EQI 2.0, her assertiveness was super high very good at standing up for herself effectively in an emotionally regulated way. Her reality testing was very high. Um, you know, that overanalyzing that she does, it helps her look at, is this true? Is this real? Is this how it really is? Her lower scores were her stress tolerance, how she copes when things are stressful, and her emotional expression, right? She's someone who doesn't share feelings at work. Okay, so that just paints a little picture of her. Here is one of the tools I would use in coaching with Mariah. There are lots of different charts like this on families of emotions. So you can see there's five general family categories on this one. I love this one because it lists all the different words. It's like a thesaurus for what afraid might feel like or what sad might feel like. This one ranks them in terms of intensity of feelings. So it's super helpful. Okay, so I would have worked with her for emotional expression to help her go. I, I have, I've had clients before who say, Christine, I feel mad, happy, sad, frustrated. That's pretty much it. Okay, like we all are differently aware of our emotions and have what different levels of what we call emotional literacy. So one of the things that would help Mariah sleep and figure things out is to be able to go, what am I feeling? Find the word and then go, oh, just be curious. Is it high intense, medium or low? And then she has the words to express it. If she's in a meeting and feeling concerned about the direction that things are going in and starting to really worry, she would look in afraid and go, ah, I'm feeling worried and cautious but I'm actually moving into the medium ones, apprehensive and kind of insecure and threatened. And I'm gonna act out of it now. Then I'm gonna regret it tonight and not sleep. So name it to tame it is what we say as coaches. This is a tool that helps you name it to tame it because you can do something about it once you identify what it is. Let's build on Mariah's experience and meet Haley. Haley often, see if this resonates for any of you. Haley often feels like her loudest emotion is the one that wins. Right? She doesn't feel in control of it. 
later she'll go, oh my gosh, look how I showed up or look what I felt or look what I went through. And it was this big red emotion that I couldn't control. Partially as a result of this, she says or does things at work that she regrets then. And having repeated that enough times, she stuffs those big loud emotions inside because she's afraid they'll burst out. Haley's highest EQI scores were interpersonal relations. She's really good at relationships and empathy. That really strong empathy of noticing and recognizing and being able to go, I wonder what that, oh, I can imagine what that would feel for them. Her lowest scores were problem solving when emotions were at play. And if you think about what, what we've already said about her, that, that would make some sense, right? If it feels like this big overwhelming emotion is going to win and she might burst out, hard then to go, hmm, I'm curious about this problem when these feelings are, are so overwhelming. Some people experience what's called emotional flooding when you can't make problems or solve problems or make decisions well because the emotion has flooded your ability and you freeze. Her other lowest score, not surprisingly, impulse control, right? She's afraid they'll burst out. And she says and does things that she, that she regrets. If you just pause and look at the interplay between those, imagine this sensitive person who values and is good at relationships and understands and empathizes with people. And because that's so important and she's so tuned in and has radar, it's hard to solve problems when she's feeling the emotions and thinking of the impact on the other people and hard to delay her, her impulses. So sometimes, I mentioned this, sometimes our emotions lead us around by the nose. We don't feel like we have um, the ability to self-regulate. A volume button I talked about already. A volume button has a lot to do with this. Putting a personal volume button on and going, wait, I can turn this down. I need to take a walk. I can cool this off. I need to count to 10, right? and choosing, okay, I need to get it to the right level for this need. Because as I mentioned before, why does the red hot emotion have to win? And that and it makes us feel out of control, not paddling our own boat. When we walk around going, I'm sorry, I did that thing. I'm sorry, I said that again. And we might out, have an outburst or cry or, or I'm gonna mention this one. Some of you might know people or do this yourself and go, I'm fine. No, I'm fine and it leaks out. When we say fine, and we're like, no, I'm fine. And everyone can tell maybe your face is red or your demeanor has changed. Um, fine as an acronym in those cases stands for feelings inside not expressed. I'm fine actually to me is a signal that the person isn't fine. And a sign that that red hot emotion might be, might be winning. So an EI strategy, is to change and turn down the hot feelings and switch them for cool ones. The reason hot, those super intense hot feelings can, sometimes they serve us. Like if you're feeling terrified, one of those hot feelings, it might be because there's a bear chasing you. So run. Sometimes they serve us, sometimes they don't. And in a business setting, they can have a spiraling down effect on our mood or our thoughts or our self-regard and get us stuck. Whereas a cool feeling in that same family of emotions, and I'll switch now so you can see them. If you identify a high red feeling that's not serving you, rather than stuffing it inside or trying to just ignore it or having it burst out at that level, you can look and for example, say, oh, I feel, I feel horrified right now. What would I, what's more reasonable that would serve me? Oh, insecure. Oh, uneasy, apprehensive. And folks, just by saying it, this is an aspect of neuroscience and the name it to tame it. As soon as you're you tell your brain, this is working with this wonderful control center, I'm feeling terrified, but I'd rather feel insecure. It's like the little minions in your brain running the show say, turn down the red alert. She wants to feel insecure instead. And we start coming down. So here are some examples within that same family, going from rage, fury, and anger to annoyance or irritation, despondency, despair, to sadness or disappointment. There's some other examples in there. It's a very 
very effective way to self-regulate. And will, can you do it in the moment when you're having an argument with someone or having a reaction? Maybe, maybe not. I have people who print off and carry that family's emotion around with them at work. You can practice this. You can pick the main emotions that get in your way. There's different ways to do this. Um, I will tell you, just this awareness, at least 50% of you will start doing this because our brain's wired to do this. It's trying to protect us. Okay, let's protect us in a more reasonable way. I'm not gonna go through this one just for time. Um, this is someone who runs on adrenaline, is in fight or, float, fight or flight, damages relationships because he's so predictable. It's likely a sign of what's called amygdala hijack, fight, fright, fight, flight, freeze, or fawn. I encourage you, we don't have time today now, but if you do a Google search for amygdala hijack video and look for ones that are those whiteboard sketch ones, there's two that pop up that are really helpful to help you understand this, which helps with impulse control. Okay, so emotional intelligence helps you in so many ways in yourself and in your leadership to be more flexible, agile, adaptable, and then whether it's empathetic or assertive or whatever you choose, you know, better impulse control, calm, reasonable, and it is needed with the pace of work these days. If you still want more, we, I already mentioned the CCA's Advanced Leadership Certificate Program has the EQI 2.0 assessment and coaching. There's, some, there's that information I mentioned earlier about it. So the EQI assessment, the one-on-one -on -one coaching, the cohort-based learning. We also do a journey map, which is a, I develop strategies and stuff and stuff. And I'm writing my first book, Paddle Your Own Boat, which will have some of my original strategies in it. The journey map is one of them. And you would get to experience that in, in EQI, mapping your journey so you can decide what you want to do going forward. You'll get immediate, immediately applicable skills, stuff you can do right away. And uh, you will then have the U of R alumni status and there's no prereqs for it. If you still want more, there's so much out there. There's a few little mini EQ assessments that you could take if you want to just kind of do this and get an idea. They're not going to be valid, reliable tools necessarily. Um, but just read through these, right? How to become more curious, open-minded, self-aware. Watch others that you think are more emotionally intelligent. Just keep going. Keep going and keep growing. 